All right, we've tried our first hand at building a classifier model. And in this, this first cut, we did, we clearly were learning something, but uh, uh, we were not learning wonderful things. Uh, but I wanted to talk uh, a little bit more about more formal, uh, more formal evaluation here. So, so far, uh, what we've, what's happened with our model is that we, we've, uh, we fit our model and now the, the model is capable of uh, computing a score for any given input that we get. And if the score is larger than some uh, threshold, then it gets labeled as a positive uh, example and otherwise it gets labeled as a, as a negative example. For uh, logistic regression in the way that I described things a couple of videos ago, that default threshold sits at 0.5 for how SGD a uh, classifier is doing things, the default threshold actually is, is zero. It's using a slightly different version of the logistic function, but, that, but the concept is, is still the same. Uh, but what we saw at the very end of uh, the last video was we were staring at this conting contingency table, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about that because this is one of those places where we actually do uh, start some of our uh, data analysis. This contingency table, uh, the other term that you're going to see uh, that's used uh, is uh, confusion matrix. And uh, it's a two by two matrix for two classes anyway. Uh, if we have more than two classes, then, then it becomes n by n. Uh, and the way it was uh, presented in the code was that we had uh, two dimensions. One was uh, ground truth. And the labels in the real world could either be positive or negative. And then we also had uh, the, the label uh, that's given by the model. And those could be either negative or, or positive as well. What this does is it gives us a, 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 this two by two table where there are uh, so a total of uh, four cells. As we've talked about before, the, the elements in this cell here are, are the cases where the truth is positive and the model labels things as positive. This is what statisticians would, will call a true positive. And the way to really read this uh, is, so what the model says is the positive and the T is, uh, uh, did the model get it right? Okay, so, uh, so with that, then uh, this opposite cell uh, in the upper left corner, this is the case where the model is, uh, is saying negative and it's getting it's getting the answer correct. So these are referred to as true negatives. The cell just to the right of that, again, the model is saying positive, but it's getting those, that answer incorrect. So those are our far, false positives. And then the last one, the last cell is our false negatives. So the model is saying negative, but it's getting it wrong. And, and as you saw with, within the, uh, the code, uh, what we do is we actually count the number of cases uh, for uh, each one of these cells. So how many, true positives, how many true positives do we have? How many false positives do we have, et cetera? So this gives us a, a four different numbers that we can use to evaluate what's going on. However, looking at these individual numbers, it can be a little bit hard to evaluate what's going on. We really have a desire to, to uh, summarize how well our model is doing uh, based on uh, a smaller number of statistics. It would be ideal to get us down to one. Uh, let's, uh, let's give that a try. So statisticians, uh, you'll, you'll see this, uh, this term precision. And that is a combination of several of the cells. This is uh, true positives over 
true positives plus false positives. The way to think of this precision uh, statistic is that it is uh, of the samples that the model labels as positives, so notice that we have uh, true positives and false positives in the denominator, it's the fraction that the, uh, the model actually gets correct. So it's of, of the samples uh, uh, labeled uh, positive by the model, uh, how many did it get right? And of course, in, in the ideal scenario, this ratio will actually be one, um, which means that uh, true positives will have some value and false positives will be zero. There's another way of looking at the, the data, and that is something called recall. And this is true positives over true positives plus false negatives. So, so that, that denominator is the sum of these two elements here, and we're asking how many are uh, in, in the right-hand cell there. Another term for this is true positive rate. And uh, it's of uh, the samples uh, that are positive, and, and are meaning in truth, uh, how many uh, did the model get right? So the precision, if you, if you look at the denominator for the precision, it's actually looking at that uh, right-hand column. Let me circle that. It's looking at this column here, true positives versus the, the right-hand column. Recall is uh, looking at that lower row instead. So, so we're getting different kinds of information uh, being summarized uh, by these two statistics. Let me go ahead and delete all of that mark up there. Okay, another uh, statistic. The next one is false positive rate. You'll see me abbreviate that as FPR. And this is equal to false positives over false positives plus true negatives. So let's look at where that sits here. Uh, this is actually looking at this, uh, this top row right here. And, and the, another way to think about this is the, it's the fraction of uh, real negatives, so, so the ground truth is negative, uh, that are uh, incorrectly labeled as positive. So this, this uh, FPR metric and uh, true positive rate metric, which, uh, which you can think of as TPR, in some sense, these are complements of one another. TPR was looking at that lower row and uh, FPR is looking at the uh, upper row. All right, so you're going to see these types of terms uh, and, and you'll see different ones for different contexts, really depending upon what the tr tradition is that someone is coming from. Uh, but 
false positive rate, true positive rate are common, precision and recall are common as well. Uh, and there are different ways of summarizing different parts of, of this table. Now, as we talked about before, the ideal scenario is that our model performs perfectly. And what that means, uh, as I mentioned before, was that, that all of our counts actually sit on this diagonal here. And we have zeros uh, sitting at the uh, off diagonal elements. If we have that particular scenario, then uh, precision is going to be one, a value of one. Recall as well will be a value of one. And false positive rate will be a value of zero. All right, so I'd like to go ahead and dig a little bit deeper into uh, these metrics. And uh, how, how did we get to the, the labels in the first place? So as we've already talked about, our model outputs a score, and if that score is greater than or equal to some particular threshold, we're going to call it positive, and uh, otherwise we're going to call it uh, negative. Now, a, a good question is, where in the world does that threshold actually come from? As we've used SGD uh, classifier in our last example, uh, it was picking a, a default threshold, but the reality is we can pick whatever we want. And in particular, we can pick something that, that works well. So how do we get at that uh, particular question? So let's, let's first start by looking at the, uh, at the distribution of possible scores. So So here's a space where I've got a uh, score down the side here, and this could be count in the, uh, in the vertical, or at least uh, density. This is another way to think about this is that this is a histogram of the scores. And uh, first thing we're going to do is separate the, tr the things that are actually positive, the ground truth positives from the ground truth negatives, and ask, what is the distribution of scores for each of those two cases? So, so one scenario is that, say, the positives, the distribution might look like this. So these are the, uh, the positive uh, labeled ones. And, uh, and let's also imagine a distribution of negatives that, say, looks something like this. So those are our, uh, our real negatives there. In, in this scenario, we could put our threshold anywhere we want. So I could put, for example, my score threshold uh, to be right here. So everything uh, that shows up on this side here, we're going to say that the model labels these as positive. And in this direction, everything is labeled by the model as, as negative. So that's not necessarily a, a particularly good choice because uh, there are lots of cases here where uh, there are positive samples that are just to the left-hand side of this threshold that if we just move the threshold over, the model would get those correct. So we could, put, we could put the threshold there. We could make a choice to, to put the threshold at this location here. That does OK, but not necessarily uh, the best. In fact, the, the better place to put our threshold is, is right. Uh, well, I did not put that quite in the right place. Let me put it right there. There we go. And I'm going to go ahead and erase these others. They're out of the way. So, so what we've done is the, the model is now, by putting the threshold at this location, the model is calling all of these positives and all of these as, uh, as negatives. So uh, if, we, if we imagine uh, integrating all of these or counting all, all of those 
uh, under the positive curve that are to the right of the uh, the threshold, then uh, though that's actually our set of true positives. And these over here on the left hand side, so let me draw, draw that in, those are our true positives. On the left hand side, these are the items that our model has labeled as negative, but are actually uh, positive. So, so these are our false uh, negatives. And likewise, it's kind of hard to draw in the rest, uh, the, the, the complement, uh, but the, the, uh, the items that fall under the curve, uh, the negative curve on the left-hand side of the threshold, those correspond to uh, the ones that the model has labeled as negative and that are actually negative. So those are our true negatives. And then this little piece right in here, that corresponds to our false positives. So these are the samples that the model has labeled as positive, but has gotten those incorrect. So, so this is sort of an ideal scenario where our false negatives and our false positives are actually uh, relatively small areas. Uh, so it's easy to, to define a, an appropriate threshold here. Um, but uh, another uh, common scenario is uh, something like this. Let's draw in another space here. So again, we're on the score dimension here, and this is count. We might have something more along the lines of there are negatives and our positives, uh, let's give that a different color. Our positives are something along these lines. And, and in this type of a scenario, it's still a bit unclear as to, as to what a good choice of threshold is. Uh, it's even harder if uh, instead my, my positives had a distribution that, that looked like, uh, like this. So, so perhaps the ideal place to draw a threshold could, could be right at that, at that spot between the two, uh, the two hills. Um, but, but, the, but the point is that uh, no matter where we put this threshold, especially in this case, we're always going to be making some uh, amount of errors. And, and in fact, let's scroll back to uh, scroll back to the our original picture here. We could uh, actually decide that making false positives is really a bad thing, and it's much worse than uh, making false negatives. So, so in that type of a scenario, it might actually make sense to shift that threshold uh, over to the uh, to the right a little bit. Let's pick a distinctive color. So we could stick it. Stick that threshold right at that location, and in this way, we would get all of the negatives uh, correct, or a vast majority of the the negatives correct. But we're going to do that at the at the expense of uh, choosing uh, incorrectly for a reasonable number of the the real positive cases. So, so part of the 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 key here is that uh, there isn't a one solution. Uh, for choosing a threshold. There are lots of different things that one could could do and it really depends on uh, What you're trying to accomplish out in the real world and what are the costs of getting things wrong? So I'm, I'm going to give you one particular answer uh, right now and uh, and then we can uh, we, we can uh, talk about this in more detail as we go through the semester. All right, in, in order to take this first step, what we're going to do is uh, come back to these two metrics here, this, uh, this false positive rate and uh, this true positive rate uh, metric. And what we're going to do is imagine uh, adjusting the threshold from one end of the spectrum to the other and, uh, and ask uh, how those two metrics change. So in the end, we're going to end up plotting 
uh, those metrics as a function of threshold. So first, let's let's just give a little bit of uh, motivation here. So let's imagine uh, we've got a, a number line here that that corresponds to our score, and I'm going to uh, to write in a set of uh, of uh, true label correct correct label. So so the the real world says that uh, our samples uh, that are uh, really negative fall at this along these lines uh, score wise and uh, and then I'm let me write in some other uh, positive uh, examples here so the vertical axis really doesn't matter here uh, what matters is where they fall along the horizontal axis so so for each of these true labels what we've uh, drawn in here is how the model is scoring each of the samples and we could choose, for example, to put the threshold at this location over here. So what this means is that the model is labeling everything as positive uh, to the right-hand side and everything to the left-hand side is, is negative. If we do this, then, then our model is going to assign uh, positives to all the samples, uh, which is not terribly uh, instructive. So this, but that's one, one possible threshold. So, so this, one way to think about this is that this is a very low uh, threshold. On the opposite end of the spectrum, I could set a very high threshold. In, in which case the model would assign negative label to everybody and assign the positive label to, to nobody. And, and our challenge then is what we're going to do is imagine sliding this threshold along. Maybe, maybe we'll stick it right here. So the model says these are positive and, and these are negatives over here. And, and then we can, uh, for this scenario, we can compute what the true positive rate is and the false positive rate. So let's go ahead and start plotting that for uh, something along these lines. So remember that our true positive rate is true positives over true positives plus false positives and our, I'm sorry, false negatives. And our false positive rate is false positives over false positives uh, plus uh, true negatives. Okay, so let me, I'm gonna draw in a, another, uh, another graph here. So this is going to be threshold along, uh, along the uh, horizontal axis, but I'm gonna switch the axes around and, and I'm doing this for good reason. So this is now going to be low threshold and this is high threshold here. You'll, you'll see why I, I want to do this. And then this is going to be, uh, this is going to be essentially a, a fraction or a probability. And, uh, and, and actually it's our true positive rate and our false positive rate. We'll plot both of those on the same uh, axis. So, so for the, the low uh, threshold case, looking up above here, that, so that's this scenario right here, we are labeling all of our uh, samples as, as positives. So, so, so if we look at our true positive rate, uh, then what that, uh, that particular threshold means is that we're not providing any, uh, any negatives so, so this term here, that's, that's zero, and we're left with TP over TP. So TPR is going to be one. So this is one right here and zero down here. And FPR, uh, uh, true negatives, uh, again, the model is not 
providing any negative labels. So it's going to be uh, assigned a zero. So, so FPR also uh, sits at, at one for that low threshold. If we look at the, the opposite end of the spectrum at, uh, at high threshold, so in this case, our model is assigning a negative label to all of the, the samples. So now we're sitting over, whoops, sorry about that. Our model, we've selected this threshold here. Our model is assigning a negative threshold to all of the samples. And what that means is that uh, true positives, uh, that's, that number is zero because our model is not assigning any positive labels. And uh, so TPR is at zero, so that sits right there. And uh, FPR, uh, in this case, we, we have no, uh, no positives, again, being assigned. So this, uh, this term here, FP, is, is zero. So, uh, so for, for an extreme high threshold, both TPR and uh, and FPR sit at zero. So they're starting and ending at the same point. Okay, so let's, let's imagine now uh, moving our threshold uh, from low uh, upwards uh, a little bit. So let's put, it, let's put it right here. So now our model is assigning positives here and negatives over here. So what does this do? For our, uh, for our FPR and TPR. Um, this particular threshold corresponds to a point that's somewhere right about here. So for, uh, for uh, a threshold at that point, we are labeling, uh, we are labeling everything to the right as positive. So it's in, in all of the pluses, uh, over here, all of those are uh, are true positives, but this this uh, FN term, false negative, the only samples that our model are labeling as negatives are these here. So it's getting all of the negatives correct. Uh, so that means FN is still zero. So TPR still sits at one at this point here. And in fact, if we slide the threshold slowly toward low threshold, we, we continue to have a, a TPR that's sitting at one. Okay, so now let's look at what is happening with FPR. So this TN here, those are the ones that the model labeled as negative and that are correctly negative. So that's all of these. That actually is four. False positives are the ones that uh, the model has labeled as positive, but it got incorrect. And those sit one, two, three, four, five. So, so what we, so this is four here, this is five, and this is five. So uh, FPR sits at five ninths, which just eyeballing it here sits uh, somewhere around in here. And in fact, if we s slowly shifted uh, that threshold back to the low threshold, then, then what we would see is uh, uh, a set of jumps. At some point, we'd, we'd jump up, uh, jump up again. And each one of these jumps corresponds to us passing uh, one of these negatives here. Uh, there's one jump, two jumps, three jumps, and then we'll have a jump up to the, uh, to the final point there. So, so in practice, you're going, you're going to see uh, a set of jumps, those should be a little bit more uh, uh, regularly spaced, uh, but that's okay. So, so these regular jumps just come from the fact that we have a very small number of samples on the left-hand side there. If I had uh, a lot more samples, then we would not be able to perceive these jumps, and, and in fact, our curve uh, will look more, much more continuous. So it, it might, uh, might look like this. So we can go through this same exercise, trying out uh, different thresholds. And, and uh, in the end, uh, what we might end up with, in particular with the, with the distribution that we drew in originally, where there's this very clear separation, 
uh, and they're both Gaussian distributions, you actually end up with a sigmoidal shape for your, so this is your uh, false positive rate. And your true positive rate uh, might, uh, might look something like this. Where it asymptotes to, to zero there. So this is TPR here. So staring at, at this picture, one can, uh, one way to make a choice about uh, what the appropriate threshold is, is to look at the difference between the TPR and the FPR. So I could, for example, choose a threshold at this point here, uh, but I'm, uh, although I'm going to be labeling uh, the, the positives correctly, I'm going to be also labeling a whole bunch of the negatives incorrectly. So this is, this is really not a, a good choice. And, and likewise, on, on the opposite end, I'm do, mostly labeling things as negatives. Uh, I'm, I'm getting the, the, the correct negatives, uh, very correct, but I'm not doing very well on the, the positives. And one, one thing I could do is ask, what the difference is between these two curves at every point and pick the one that corresponds to the, the maximum. And that sits somewhere right about uh, in here. And this, this point of, of uh, maximum difference, uh, statistically, there's a very nice uh, set of ideas. Um, this is called the komogorov shmirnov uh, distance. And this particular um, metric is actually, in the statistical world, it's, it's a way of telling the difference between two distributions. Uh, so this is distinct from, say, a t-test or a z-test that that's a test of uh, the, uh, the means of two distributions. The, the KS test, kolmogorov shmirnov test, is all about testing the, the shape of the distributions. This uh, statistic also, uh, the dif dis difference between TPR and FPR, uh, TPR minus FPR, this is actually equal to uh, something else uh, called the Pierce skill score. or you'll see me abbreviating that as PSS. So, so PSS exists at every different threshold here. The komogorov shmirnov distance, uh, that is the, the threshold, that is, that is the difference between the two at the threshold that, that maximizes the, the difference. All right, I wanted to introduce a, a couple of other uh, ideas before we actually get into code. Um, this particular uh, picture here that we've already drawn. This is actually, these are actually cumulative distributions. You can think of those as, as uh, CDFs. Um, there's a different way to summarize them, um, which is to draw uh, TPR as a function of FPR. So, so what we end up doing is we, we sample the, the possible range of, of thresholds, and at each point we compute a TPR and an FPR, and then we plot that in a scatter plot. And that picture looks like this. So FPR is along the horizontal and TPR is, is here. And ref referring back to this original picture here, with a very high threshold, both were zeros. So this is zero, zero here and uh, at the very low threshold, both were one. So let's uh, let's put that right here. So that's one in FPR and one in TPR. And for for this particular case, if we were to draw TPR versus FPR, we would end up with with something that kind of looks a curve that kind of looks like this. Oops, I've overshot there. 
this diagonal line that we have here, if I had a, a model that uh, guessed the, uh, the highest frequency uh, category, so it wasn't smart, it didn't do anything with the inputs, it just, it just took the highest frequency category, um, uh, we would fall along this diagonal line here. So, um, so the point is that uh, what we really want this, uh, this curve here to do is be as far away from the diagonal as possible. This particular picture is called a receiver operator characteristic curve. So ROC curve is what, what, you, what you'll see. Um, as our classifier gets worse and worse, uh, you'll start to see curves that, that more do this kind of thing. Uh, and furthermore, the ideal curve is one where there is some threshold for which we maximize TPR. We get a TPR of one and an FPR of zero. And what that means is that we hit this point here. So the curve would be would, would be a box. So, so one way to actually summarize the, the, the quality of our uh, classifier is to ask what the, what the area under the curve is. So, so area under the curve, oops. And by curve, we mean the ROC curve. So you, you will see metrics reported as AUC, area under the curve. In the ideal case for, for that orange, uh, the, the AUC is equal to one. So, so that's just, we're just integrating the, the, the region underneath the orange curve. Uh, for our diagonal, uh, the AUC is equal to uh, one half. And this AUC here might be something like 0.6. Uh, and this one here might be 0.75 or something along those lines. So the closer we get to one, the, the, better, uh, the better we are. What's, what's nice about this AUC metric is that it allows us to score a classifier without actually making a commitment as to which threshold we're going to choose. And, and, and so this is why you're going to see in, uh, in the literature and various evaluations, this AUC metric being reported. It's, it's not necessarily uh, the most informative. Uh, ultimately, we might care about the Pierce skill score instead, uh, but it is a very nice summary of what the classifier can do. Okay, so we've, we've talked a lot about statistics now, and the next step is to do a little bit of code around that. 